and I'm Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I want to welcome everyone to our program this evening. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, as we usually do. Um, if you uh, are not going to be speaking at any time, make sure you are muted. Uh, we sometimes do hear background sounds, so uh, you know, again, make sure you're on mute. Um, so thank you so much. And it's already Tuesday, November 2nd. Uh, if you had voting to do today, I hope you got that done. Very important to vote. And uh, I think uh, there is a vote for maybe some snow, as they're saying, maybe tonight or tomorrow. How do you like that? No, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people <laughs> say, saying yay. Um, I don't mind winter, but uh, I wish it wouldn't snow so much sometimes. <laughs> But again, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Welcome to our Western Cuyahoga Audubon member meeting and speaker series. I think you'll enjoy our presentation this evening. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Again, that's me. I'm board member and membership chair. And I want to welcome everybody again. Um, and I do also want you to pay real close attention to the gorgeous photographs. Uh, that have been added to these. These are beautiful. Michelle has really become a wonderful photographer. Beautiful, beautiful white crown sparrow. Uh, next slide, please. As I always try to remind everyone, uh, no matter what time of the year, although we really like to get our memberships done early in the year, we do accept memberships uh, throughout the year. Our membership year runs from September 1st through the end of August, so August 31st. Uh, memberships begin as low as $20 for student or limited income, or uh, up to, uh, you can see, $750 for a benefactor. Um, but with a membership, again, it really helps our chapter, and this is chapter-only membership, it really helps our chapter uh, keep the gears running, and uh, also to uh, fund some, some of our special projects. So again, if you are not a member, think about becoming a member and you can find that membership link on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. Next, please. Um, I right now am in the, the uh, representative to COAC, the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, which uh, again, these are chapters all throughout Ohio that meet and try to help each other. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, the COAC, Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, had their fall gathering on Saturday, October 16th, and it, we were going to be meeting uh, in, uh, in person in Columbus, but again, with COVID going on, uh, it was changed to a Zoom meeting. Um, the meeting was, uh, was recorded, and you can get that recording at the COAC website, which is www.councilloac.org. Click on the button that says COAC 2021 Fall Gathering Report. You will hear all the speakers, um, and there were some really dynamic ones talking about volunteerism. Um, Ken Kaufman spoke. Um, let's see, there was a young birder who is now a little older, but he spoke. There was a panel discussion. So again, some good information, uh, again, from this Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters. Next, please. And uh, since I'm the representative, um, you know, we really do need a representative that is dedicated to um, report to the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters from Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And really, it's very simple. It's uh, attending a monthly one-hour Zoom meeting with other Audubon Chapters. Uh, that representative would report information from our chapter to COAC, and then report back to our chapter what COAC has discussed uh, at that meeting. Um, there would be a, attendance at, at the spring and fall gatherings, and sometimes they're on Zoom, like we just had, and other times they are throughout the state. So they might be western, a little bit more further, western Ohio, central Ohio, uh, even southern Ohio. So uh, a little bit of travel might be needed 
And then, of course, we're not going to leave anybody floundering. Um, the Western Cuyahoga or Audubon Board will assist that representative in updating uh, information and, and just getting on board. Next, please. This is a really important one that is coming up. Um, Sherwin-Williams Company, uh, which is a Cleveland-based company, is going to be building a headquarters building in downtown Cleveland. Uh, they're also constructing a research and development building in Brecksville, but it's the building in downtown Cleveland that is of most concern. Uh, the building, and uh, Michelle, if you go to the next slide, please. This is the uh, architect, architect's ren rendering of the Sherwin-Williams headquarters that's circled in that brownish red color. It's clad in glass. This is not good. Um, and you can even see the reflection of looks like um, one of the buildings downtown. I think that's, I don't think that's the key building, is it? Yeah, I can't remember. But you can see it's clad in glass, and this is uh, something that a lot of Audubon chapters, uh, organizations, really would like Sherwin-Williams to do a little bit of changing uh, and have bird-friendly glass. So, Michelle, let's go back to that other slide, the first slide. That was, all right. So with that building that is in planning stage right now and going to be built soon, um, the architect's renderings, again, the exterior is clad in glass. And of course, as we know, that birds collide with buildings, uh, especially ones that are clad in glass and have nighttime lighting. Um, and this will, a building like this can and, and will cause major mortality to migratory songbirds, particularly in spring and fall. So our chapter of the Audubon, uh, other Audubon chapters, other birding organizations are going to be taking steps to write letters to the City of Cleveland Planning Commission. Uh, and, and also potentially to the Sherwin-Williams company to really encourage some changes to that glass. There is bird-friendly uh, glass uh, that has, uh, or bird-safe glass that has markings on it. There's U it can reflect UV light, which birds can see. Um, and so we're really, really going to have a letter writing campaign through the, our organization and we would like our members involved, too, to write letters. Um, a sample letter will be sent out shortly. I have a meeting tomorrow with other organizations. We want to get all of our, no pun intended, ducks in a row to make sure that the letters that are, that are draft letters or letters that you can write uh, or, or copy uh, are, are positive. We want to. We want to uh, have. Uh, uh, we want the Sherwin Williams to remain in Cleveland. We want them to to have employment here. We're simply asking that um, that the glass be bird safe. So we want it to be positive. We want to have a, a strong front, and you know, with with uh, data behind it too. We just don't want to say, well, X many birds get killed. I mean, there we have data from downtown Cleveland. Uh, as to what the mortality is on some of these buildings. So please keep uh, informed um, through our email blasts. Uh, Western Cuyahoga will also have it on their website. And uh, once, we, once we get that letter, that draft letter ready, then we will also send uh, the list of people to whom that letter should be sent. So we're hoping that um, that Sherwin Williams will will do the right thing for for themselves for the birds and become a, a real leader in in conservation uh, uh, and and their building structure. Next slide, please. We'll, we'll pass by. There you go. Well, on a happier note, um, I also am the coordinator for our Lakewood Circle Christmas Bird Count, 
And our bird count will be on Sunday, December 26th. That is the date of the count itself. But we're also going to have a couple of other meetings. We're going to have a uh, virtual kickoff on Monday, December 13th at 7. Uh, we will be going over all, all the places that need coverage. We will talk about how to enter your data um, and uh, also have some bird identification, some of the tough species that you might try to figure out. Hey, is that a purple finch? Is that a house finch at coming to your feeder? So, uh, so we, we really would like you to join in um, to be part of the Christmas bird count. And then we'll also have a wrap up. So after the bird count is over and I get all the data in, we're going to have a fun time going through the list. And that will be on Monday, January 10th at 7 o'clock. Again, it will be a virtual wrap up. Um, and. Uh, We'll just really have a good time going through the list and, and just seeing what species we are able to, to uh, find. We did superbly this, well, actually last year. Um, so so um, we hope that you can get involved in our Lakewood Circle Christmas bird count. Next, please. All righty, Michelle. All right, that's me. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> All right, so I am a board member and field trip co-coordinator. And I will be reporting to you today on the second Saturday bird walk and a report of few virtual field trips, tree mutt bird walks, early evening bird walks, and a little um, statement about our social media and how you can connect with us. All right, so please join us on November 13th at 9 a.m. at the Rock River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, and Ken Gober are leading the walk. All right, this past second Saturday was held on October 9th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, we had 28 observers at the October 2021 second Saturday of the month bird walk. 36 species were tallied. It was a sunny day with temperatures starting at 63 degrees and ending at 73 degrees. Four warbler species were observed with a high count of 15 yellow rip warblers. Several flocks of American goldfinch were scattered in several locations. One highlight was a yellow-bellied sapsucker that tried to keep out of sight. Best highlight was a juvenile bald eagle that was perched in a dead tree several yards off the trail. The eagle was very cooperative, letting many people get close to unobstructed views. And there you see a picture of that bald eagle uh, by Sean Misick, who attended the walk at the Nature Center. All right, October's virtual field trip. Um, last month, our virtual field trip was held at any cemetery to celebrate Halloween. Our target species was sparrows. The virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird list takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on November 10th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, uh, please do so by end of day Friday this week. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit uh, a cemetery last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, it is the month of Thanksgiving, so let's look for wild turkey. We'll also look for the white-throated sparrow, too. Chagrin River Park is a great location for birding. It features handicapped parking spaces at all entrances, heated restroom facilities at the west and east entrances, and compacted gravel and asphalt trails. Uh, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org and clicking the Field Trips tile and then Field, field Reports 2021. All right, the final Tremont Bird Walk of 2021 was held on October 23rd. Uh, there will be no walks in November and December due to the holidays, and we will resume in January 2022 
Um, but here is a picture of a great blue heron by Sean Nissig, who attended um, the final walk of 2021 at the Towpath Trail at Tremont. And again, um, just like the, the Tremont bird walks are um, evening bird walks, uh, we had our last one October 20th, and we will resume them in the spring of 2022 when we have ample daylight in the evening hours. Um, the locations for our early evening bird walks, they vary each month at a different location, um, always led by Nancy Howell and some other bird walk leaders that, um, that, that come and, and find all the birds for us. And we have a pileated woodpecker here by Al Rand who attended our final uh, walk of the year at the um, Lagoon Picnic Area and Rocky River Reservation. And finally, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities uh, by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo to Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded, like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned, and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I also want to reiterate that attending the virtual field trip meetups, uh, which take place on the second Wednesday after the virtual field trip, so the October field trip virtual meetup will be uh, in the, on November, was it 10th, is that right? Yes. Um, you don't, don't, didn't have to go on the field trip, you didn't, you didn't just come. It's great to see the lists, it's great to see the photographs, hear the stories, so it, it'll get you inspired to, to want to go out, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Michelle, for getting all that together and coordinating everything. Of course. Uh, Drina Nemeth is uh, our book uh, coordinator, and we started one of our book series, and I'm going to have Drina take it away. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, we had our first book discussion just one week ago tonight, and as you can see from this slide here, our themes this year are birding and conservation, and we're looking at nonfiction and historical fiction. And we started out with a historical fiction book. Next slide, please. Where the World Ends by Geraldine McCochran. She's an English author, and she has written an amazing, exciting historical fiction book. Uh, for this book, Where the World Ends, she received a prestigious award, the Carnegie Medal. And she had also received it 30 years ago for another book called A Pack of Lies. Next slide. I hope this slide conveys just a little bit of like the remoteness, the wildness uh, of this area of Northwest Scotland, St. Kilda's Islands, and what we see here are called what the Scottish call stacks, and they're uh, outcroppings of rock. And as you can see, they're, uh, they're totally devoid, really, of any kind of vegetation. There are no trees, no plants. And uh, there's caves with the, uh, on these stacks. And the story is about a true story of uh, nine boys and three men, and their stay on this front stack, the tallest one called the Warrior Stack, for nine months. They went there, and this takes place in the early 1800s, they, 1700s, excuse me, and they went there to collect birds to go fowling because that was a, a huge source of food, and it was also a source of fuel, which is, this was new information to me, but the, many of these birds are quite oily and they can use the oil uh, to for their fuel. So it, it was a yearly event that 
the men and the boys would go out to these stacks and fowl. And there were hundreds and hundreds of birds. So what happens to them then is the story of this book because they go out there for what they anticipate to be three weeks, but the return boat does not come. So there they are on this stack for nine months. And that's what the book is about, how they handle it emotionally, psychologically, what happens with their food and their nutrition. Next slide, please. I wrote to the author and I asked her about her interest in birds and she told me a little bit uh, that she is interested in birds but that she worked with a Scottish ornithologist whose name is John Love and he really did all the research for this book and she incorporated so much of the natural history of these birds so it's there's a lot of uh, you know nonfiction to this too with how she portrays the birds and how they some of them become characters actually I just wanted to show you a, a couple pictures of the birds that she works with and um, there were eight birds in the book that were, we get to know a lot about but here we have on this first slide a gannet uh, with a baby chick which is called a guga and gannets were a huge source of food and the gugas especially were considered a delicacy and then we have a picture of the extinct great auk and and in the story a great auk they called it a garefowl has a very important role in the story and uh, serves to add something big to the plot Next slide, please. The storm petrel turns out to be such an oily bird, and I hope this doesn't scare people too much, but they make they put wicks inside of these birds and use them as candles. That's what they did back then. And then we have the gorgeous puffin, and that was a huge source of food for them too. One thing we learned about puffins from this is that they beat their wings 400 times a minute, which I, I just found astounding. And also their beaks fall off after they breed, which I did not know. Next slide, please. So that was our first book. And then in January, we'll be reading Silent Spring. And then for our April book, it will be The Feather Thief. Next slide, please. So Silent Spring, we will be talking about Tuesday, January 25th. And this is a, such an important work in terms of conservation. And so that'll, that's one reason why we're reading it. It is a classic book to take us uh, back in time and to learn what Rachel wrote and hear a little bit more about the influence she had over, over all these years. And this slide shows how you can, um, the uh, address for our book clubs. We encourage uh, registration so that if we need to, we can communicate with you ahead of time and also to gauge how many people will be there. And then also you can obtain the book at Amazon or check your library and, and you may prefer to read a hard copy or an eBird, uh, excuse me, an uh, electronic format and uh, or an audio version. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Drina. Yes, that, that sounded exciting. I cannot believe they actually used the birds like candles. They weren't alive, were they? No. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't see lighting a wick on a live bird. That would be bad. All righty. All right, next, please few more announcements. Um, we are still uh, accepting donations for the Gene the Ski Memorial Fund. This is to help with our Bluebird Box project. Uh, the Bluebird boxes right now are empty and are ready for next spring. 
Uh, the boxes go up in the Rocky River Reservation at the Lewis Road Riding Ring, and we had a very, very good year with bluebirds as well as tree swallows, and uh, we are perhaps looking to expand our bluebird trail. Uh, so it's just a start, but we're always accepting uh, donations to the Miski Memorial Fund. And you can see where you can uh, get that um, information and, of course, check our website. Next, please. We also have some fundraisers. One of the ways that we raise funds is by selling a product called Tilf Soil. And it is produced from composted food waste right here in Cleveland by a company called Rust Belt Riders. And if you were here last month, you heard about how Rust Belt Riders started, how they have grown to create a wonderful, wonderful set of soil products um, that are, um, again, composted material. And it does help with uh, global warming, the, all the methane that might be produced from things going into just a landfill are, are being, uh, really the, the plant material or the materials that they collect are being made into this terrific soil. So uh, again, go to our website, you can order uh, bags of different sizes and different qualities. There's one for house plants, one for gardens, and it's not too early to start thinking about gardening, never, never, never. So, and think about maybe a, um, uh, something for a, a holiday gift. So that's a possibility too. And you can see, please order by the 10th of November. Next, please. We also sell, again, as a fundraiser, uh, Birds and Beans Coffee, which is, again, Smithsonian, shade-grown, bird-friendly coffee. It's organic and fair trade, and again, would make a great holiday gift. Uh, I just delivered some the other day, and the person who I delivered it to says he will not drink anything else. He loves it. He says it has a wonderful flavor. There are uh, different varieties. There's decaf as well as caffeinated. There's different roasts. Again, order uh, online by the 10th of November. Next, please. And, uh, yep, we have a photography contest. And, well, of course, Thanksgiving. What do you think we're going to choose? Wild turkeys. So, again, if you'd like to become part of our uh, photography contest. Please turn in your uh, photographs. Take a photograph or have a photograph sent in. It doesn't have to be taken this year, but if you do take some photographs this year, anywhere between November 1st and the end of November, uh, send it in and we will select a one of the winners for the contest. Next, please. Oh boy, ice cream. Well, maybe you don't want to have ice cream in the winter. Wrong. Um, again, we're always raising funds and we do have Mitchell's Homemade Ice Cream gift cards. Uh, they are $10 denominations. They make great stocking stuffers or, or holiday gifts or gifts for birthdays. And we can uh, deliver them to you or send them uh, in the mail to you. So again, you can order them online. Uh, at our, uh, at our uh, Western Car Hog Audubon store. Next. Next month, uh, on Tuesday, December 7th, we are, our speaker series is going to be a couple of locals, Chad and Chris Saladin, who are the Peregrine Watchers. They watch Peregrines on the Terminal Tower, on some of the bridges, but they're really going to give us a much closer look at the peregrines uh, that nest on the Hilliard Road Bridge there in Rocky River uh, and over the Rocky, uh, in the Rocky River Reservation. Um, I just drool over the photographs that they have. They're superb photographers. And they're just really going to take us through um, the pair that has nested on, that, on the bridge uh, some of the, the, the young that they've produced, and really, you'll truly enjoy 
next month's presentation by Chad and Chris Saladin. So we hope to see you there. But this evening, next slide please, there you go, we have Dr. Kaya Provost uh, from the Ohio State University. And um, the way I wanted to get this information to us or to you is I've been trying to reach some folks at the Bohr Lab of Bioacoustics, which is their lab that has uh, sounds of birds as well as other uh, organisms, insects, and so forth. And they don't have anybody staffing that at the time. But Dr. Provost um, contacted me and said, oh, I am working, uh, she's a postdoc, and she's working with uh, the, on the evolution of bird songs uh, with Brian uh, is that, uh, Karstens and, uh, at the Museum of Biological Diversity at The Ohio State University. And she said, oh, I would be happy to do a presentation. So I am totally thrilled that we're going to be getting information about how the, the data, the, all these bird song, how it's being used uh, at the Bohr lab. So I am going to uh, allow Dr. Provost to take it away and share with us the information that she has. And we are so grateful that you were able to join us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about my work. I just need to go through the rigmarole of getting my screen set up. Um, yeah, one second. I have stopped sharing and I am going to make you co-host Thank you. right now. Let me know if you have any problems. All right. Let's see how this goes then. I haven't done this since we practiced. All right. Top point slides. Here we go. Okay. We seem to have not crashed the computer. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you all for inviting me to speak today. So yes, I'm Dr. Kaya Provost. As I was introduced, I am a postdoctoral fellow at The Ohio State University, and I am working in the Bohr Laboratory of Bioacoustics. I actually, to my knowledge, am the only person working in the Bohr Laboratory of Bioacoustics officially, um, but I will talk a, a little more about that later. Um, and as I'm going, I do want to say I'll be stopping periodically through the presentation for questions. Um, so if you have questions as you go along, you can put them in the chat, or once we stop, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. I'll be popping away from my speaker notes so that I can actually see who's asking things. Um, but today, what I'm really excited to talk to you about is the work that me and some of my colleagues have been doing. And we've been taking a big focus on a really equally big question, which is, what do we do with all of the song data that we have? So first things first, I want to give you a little background about myself. So I'm an ornithologist primarily, um, and I devote much of my time to studying birds of all kinds, mostly birds in North America. Um, but I have dabbled on some birds uh, in other groups here and there. And second, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Now what I study is how they've evolved through time from their most distant, more dinosaur-like ancestors to the absolutely stunning diversity of birds that we see today. Um, and the topics that I focus on within evolutionary biology are bioacoustics, which again is the study of animal sounds, phylogeography, which is how organisms are related to each other across space, and machine learning. And machine learning you've probably heard a lot about in the news over the last five years or so, but essentially that is when we teach computers how to answer questions for us in ways that let us work with lots of different kinds of data at once. Um, for those of you who might be curious, I did my undergraduate in ecology and evolution at Cornell University. I got my master's in conservation biology at Columbia University. And finally, I got my doctorate in comparative biology at the American Museum of Natural History. And then now my postdoctoral fellowship is at The Ohio State University. I actually only just recently moved to Columbus in August because I've been working remotely from New York for the last year and a half. Um, but I like Ohio so far, so 
Thanks for keeping the state great. Um, briefly, just to talk about what I've done in the past, most of my past work has actually focused on the southwestern deserts of North America. So I've looked at 11 species of birds across that region. Um, and though I won't talk too much about that today, um, these two deserts that I've highlighted are the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert. And they're super cool uh, because the two deserts, although they have very similar habitats and climates, they have very different groups of birds despite that. Um, so a lot of my previous work has been trying to tease out why that was. And then I've also worked a lot on parrots. Um, so parrots are the single most endangered group of birds on the planet, but they are also extremely cool birds. They have really high intelligence and they can learn how to speak or they can learn to mimic other sounds. Um, and this map in the back is from a paper that we worked on where we um, were describing relationships between all the species of parrots. And that map shows the diversity of parrots across the world. Um, so those warmer colors are areas that have more species of parrots. So the Amazon and um, areas around Australasia in particular. Okay, so I'm here though to talk about bioacoustics. So let's talk about birds and what their communication strategies are. So this is probably pre preaching to the choir, but birds have a really absolutely dizzying array of their songs and their calls. And this diversity and all the functions that those have, we've really studied across many different facets of biology. So we've looked at how song develops in the brain. We've looked at how the sounds they make are important both within individuals of the same species, but also individuals of different species. And we've also looked at how song contributes to speciation in general across many different groups. Um, so anyone who's been outside during spring breeding season knows that uh, each species sings different songs for different reasons. Um, but what we also know is those differences help to keep these species separated from each other and prevent them from miscommunicating. Now, one cool thing that we know happens in lots of species, not just in birds, but also happens pretty notably in humans, is this change in behaviors over time. And we usually see this happen through a process called cultural evolution. And if you haven't heard this term before, you still have experienced cultural evolution firsthand. So I want to briefly define these terms. So the biological definition of culture is it's information that affects behavior it's learned from other members of the species, and it's learned through teaching and through imitation. Cultural evolution is then the change in this information through time. And some things that have been considered cultural evolution include fads, fashion, memes, slang, um, and fashion in particular is a really great example of cultural evolution in humans, partially because we have records of how clothing styles have changed going back to practically the beginning of civilization. So here's just a quick example of some Caucasian American women's fashions from the 60s and 70s. And you can really see how the day-to-day -day behaviors of these women were changing through time. And then on a much longer scale, which is a lot more important for birdsong, is the fact that cultural evolution leads to changes in the languages that we use. So these are some of the Romance languages, and of them, Latin is thought to have been the language that originated all the others. So these four who are here. And you can tell that by comparing the vocabulary that they use. So these words are all words for good or well in their respective languages. And they all have similar features. So they all start with a B and they all have an N or an M sound because they came from the same original word. But we see that the vowels that are used really vary across languages as people through time have changed the way that they pronounce things. One of my favorite things that cultural evolution causes is dialects, which happens in both people and in birds. Um, so this is one of my favorite examples of human dialects across the United States. And this shows um, survey answers to the question, what is your generic term for a sweetened carbonated beverage? So in New York and the Northeast where I grew up, we call that soda. Um, in Ohio, the generic term is pop, according to the survey. Um, down in Texas, where I've done some of my research, that generic term is Coke. So people would say, what kind of Coke do you want? I would like a Sprite. Um, and then over in Arizona, that term once again becomes soda. And the same process happens in birds. So in Northern Cardinals, which I'm showing here, we see that these dialects have formed in the same parts of their range. 
So these images that have popped up are spectrograms, which are visualizations of songs. And I'll talk more about spectrograms later, but for now, just know that the different shapes that you see make different sounds. And in fact, in cardinals, these dialects make such different sounds that we can see them change in as little as 10 miles. And birds more than 50 miles apart have almost completely non-overlapping dialects to the point where the birds actually don't recognize each other's songs anymore, which is pretty astounding. And this has fascinated people throughout the whole lifespan of humanity um, to the point where many of us go out and record them either for scientific purposes or just because we'd like to. So many of those recordings have luckily ended up in public repositories of song. So a couple that you might have heard of are here. So Zeno Canto is in the middle, which is a fully online repository. And then Cornell University has eBird and the Macaulay Library on the right. Now, both of these take recordings from the general public as well as from scientists, and there are truly millions of them available, although the eBird and the Macaulay Library data sets overlap a lot. Zeno Canto alone has over 400 days worth of recorded songs available if you played them back to back, and Cornell probably has twice that. And that's not even mentioning the dozens of other smaller libraries of sound, both in North America and across the world, which don't just have bird sounds, but also have sounds for bats, insects, whales, frogs, you name it, if it makes a sound, we probably have a recording of it somewhere. So this really begs the question, which is the main purpose of my talk, what do we do with it all? It's too much song data for any one person or even a group of people to listen to in a lifetime with any real ability to analyze it. Now, to answer this today, so I'm going to break this down into three major subpoints. So these are the major parts of my talk. First, how much of the data is actually out there and what does that song data look like? Second, how do we summarize all of this data usefully? And third, how does this communication using song evolve across bird communities? So what kinds of things can we discover about birds from these data? Okay, so I'll start off with this first point. Um, what exactly is out there for the data that we have? I've already jumped this gun a little because I told you that there's a lot, literally years worth of recordings, but today I'm gonna focus on song data from three of these sources. So these three libraries vary in how much they have as well as where and when the recordings come from. So the Bora Lab of Bioacoustics, again, which is where I'm based, has about 34,000 recordings. They're almost entirely exclusive to North America and they were heavily recorded from the 40s to the 90s. Both Zeno Canto and the Macaulay Library, on the other hand, they're larger uh, and they have a lot more modern data. Although today I'm mostly going to be talking about Bora Lab and Zeno Canto. Now, the Bora Lab of Bioacoustics, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't talk a little bit about it, as it's sort of our homegrown library of sound, um, and it's where we are now. Uh, so we are small compared to the other two ones, but we are mighty. So our lab is the second largest physical database behind the Macaulay Library and it is the third most diverse, both with respect to species, um, as well as sounds, uh, behind Macaulay, as well as the Florida Museum. But what we are number one in is we have the most time series, which means we have the most species with the most consecutive years of data than any other library. So there are about 900 species recorded over the 65 years we've been around, and nearly half of those have at least 20 years worth of consecutive recordings. And on top of that, over 200 of our species have at least 40 years of consecutive recordings, most of them being from Ohio. So the lab was formed in 1948 by its namesake, Dr. Donald J. Bohr. Uh, he was an entomologist by trade, yet uh, despite that, he focused a lot on birds, especially around the Midwest. So we have 34,000 recordings and over 15,000 of them were made by Borer himself. So during World War II, Borer was in the Navy where he learned about a machine called a vibralizer and it was designed to visualize sounds into what we now call spectrograms. So this is a spectrogram of a white crowned sparrow song. So what spectrograms show, if you're unfamiliar, is they show pitch through time. So the color shows how loud a sound is and these were originally visualized by playing a recording and burning a piece of paper anytime the machine detected the sound. Uh, now we have digital and non-flammable ways of producing them though. So 
um, Borer and his colleagues published one of the first spectrograms of birdsong in 1953. They were technically beat out by some British researchers the year prior, um, but they were hot on their heels here in America. Now, I can't talk about Borer lab history without talking about probably one of the most important figures in Borer lab history, uh, and this is Dr. Sandra Gantz. She was the first official curator of the collection starting in 1984, and she still to this day volunteers in our collection. Um, among her many other accomplishments, she founded the Ornithological Societies of North America. She fully digitized all of the tape recordings in the Borer Lab collection, and she pulled in five NSF grants to support the development of the lab through her tenure. Um, now, as Nancy mentioned, the Borer Lab doesn't have a curator right now, but the museum hired a bird specialist, uh, Dr. Tamaki Yuri, in 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And part of her responsibilities is to maintain the recordings until we can get a curator. OK, so uh, that's the Bora Lab history. Now let's look at these different libraries of sound. So first off, when were they recorded? So this is what I'm showing you here. So this is the number of sounds recorded in each database through time. The years go from left to right. Um, and then the higher peaks have more songs recorded. And they're four-week rolling averages, so they're roughly months. The Xenocanto recordings are in black, and the Borer Lab recordings are in red. And for Xenocanto, you can see there is a lot of activity towards the more recent years, especially after 2005, which is when the database was officially founded. Everything before 2005 are historical recordings that were added after the fact. Now, the Borer Lab you can barely see, so we'll zoom in on it. Um, and here we've blown up the section of the Borer Lab recordings. And there's a lot of activity starting in 1948, which is when Borer began recording, through to about 2006, which is when the curator after Dr. Gaunt retired. And um, you may have noticed that there are distinctive peaks along these. Um, and what these are is they actually reflect the individual months across the year. Um, so again, we've got the Borer Lab in red and Zena Canto in black. Um, but this time I'm showing you the heights or the percentage of the recordings per month. And there's an absolutely huge increase in spring and summertime. I realized just now that uh, the labels on here are not quite right, um, but the leftmost is January and it goes one month all the way through to December. Um, so apologies for that. Um, now having a big peak in spring and summer is probably not a surprise. The weather's nice. There's a lot of migrants, and academics like Don Borer are not teaching, so they can actually go around and record things. The Xenocanto data doesn't have it as much, and we think this is because the Borer lab is really North American and Northern Hemisphere, but Xenocanto has a lot more data from the Southern Hemisphere, where our winter is their summer, and they could go out and record a little bit more easily. Alrighty, so that's when. What about where all these places are recorded? So here's two maps of North America, and it shows exactly where the songs were actually recorded from. So let me tell you how to read these. Now, each of these pixels is one large part of North America, um, and the uh, pixels are roughly 100 miles wide. Now, the colors show the number of songs that are recorded, with the brighter yellow colors having more songs than the darker blue. And anywhere you see gray, there's no songs recorded there. So for instance, a lot of Canada doesn't have any recordings, which is mostly because those parts of Canada don't have a lot of people in them. And then on the left, we've got the Borer Lab, and on the right, we've got Zeno Canto. So what we see, for starters, the Borer Lab holdings, again, are mostly restricted to the United States. And there's a lot of patchiness in the recordings, but where things are recorded, they tend to be recorded over and over again. Zeno Canto has a lot more coverage, and it has a lot more recordings overall. But in both, the Northeast and the Southwest have a lot more recordings than in other places. So for some reason, people really like to go to those places and record birds. On the other hand, the middle of the United States, so what some people call Tornado Alley, a lot fewer recordings. People really don't want to record birds in Kansas or Nebraska or the Dakotas. So if you take nothing away from my talk, please, if you're in these areas, record the local birds. We really want to know what they sound like. And then real quick, I want to show you a map of Ohio in particular. So this map shows something a little different. So instead of the number of recordings in an area, it's instead color-coded by the number of species with recordings in an area. So brighter yellows have more species, darker blue less, and gray again is zero. So the areas around major cities have a lot of recordings, especially around Columbus. Um, and this is also true around the marshlands around Lake Erie, 
And you folks in your uh, Cleveland seem to be doing a pretty good job yourselves. But southeastern and northwestern Ohio really don't have anything. So again, if you find yourselves in these areas, please record the local curves. Okay, so that is part one. It's the heftiest part. So to sum up, um, well, we've got years, if not decades, worth of data to listen to. Most of it was recorded in the Northern Hemisphere spring and summer, and in North America, some regions have a lot of recordings and some don't have any. So that really answers our questions of what do the data look like. Okay, so I'm going to stop now for questions before I continue, and I will bop back to the video so that I can see if anybody um, has put in a chat or anything. So feel free to unmute yourselves and send something to the chat. Um, and uh, if not, I will does anybody have any questions you can either un again unmute and ask your question you know say your name and or if you prefer typing your question in the chat box I don't see any questions there anyone all right I will power all right Yep, you may continue on. All right. What? Okay. There's a lot of data out there. We could definitely use more in specific parts of the world. But what do we do with all of it? How do we take it and turn it into something we can use in a way that doesn't take us decades? So the information for most of these songs is captured in spectrograms, so like this one I showed you earlier. Again, this is a white-crowned sparrow song. And these birds are really notable because they're probably one of the most studied North American birds in terms of their song. This is what this spectrogram sounds like. And hopefully that came through, and if not, I apologize. Um, but there's a long initial whistle and then a lot of variable buzzy notes right after. So when we want to work with these spectrograms, we first want to extract syllables. And I have to shout out my student, Ji Yang, who's done a lot of this work. Um, much like syllables in our languages, these are the units that the birds put together to form the grammar and the syntax of their communication. Um, so we have been using software from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Raven to actually find and label the syllables. And the syllables are the units of analysis that I'll be talking about moving forward. Now given the sheer amount of songs that we want to label, we wanted a relatively automatic process to do that um, both the labeling and anything afterward for our analyses. So that's our first step, develop a way to extract out syllables of the song. Now fortunately for us, there's a software program called TweedyNet, which is specifically designed to label syllables and sounds, and it also has an awesome logo. So TweedyNet does this labeling using supervised machine learning. And you might have heard about that lately. Um, Supervised machine learning, in particular deep learning, is sort of the cutting edge for a lot of things um, in biology, in technology, et cetera. Uh, this is how um, autocorrect works on your phone. This is how Facebook knows to suggest that this is someone's face, and so on and so forth. But essentially, we're teaching a computer to do a task. And in this case, we're teaching TweetyNet to label syllables. So what we do is we label the sounds manually, and then we take those labels along with their audio recordings and we put them into TweetyNet. TweetyNet uh, then learns which part of the recordings are syllables and which are noise or silence. I won't go into the details behind this, but ultimately this is doing a bunch of math to learn that. So this learning procedure is called training. And then once we've trained TweetyNet, we can show it a bunch of other audio recordings that don't have any labels and we ask it to label it for us. And now so far we have done this, uh, I've shown you this just with White Crown Sparrow song, but they don't just have to be from White Crown Sparrows either. We can have it label data from lots of different species. Now one thing we want to know as a quick aside is how well this works on different species and if we should try it. So what we did to figure that out is we trained TweetyNet on White Crown Sparrow songs and then we asked it to label using songs of different species. And these species vary in how closely related that they are to white-crowned sparrows. So we measured how accurate TweetyNet was. Basically, we calculated how often TweetyNet correctly labeled a syllable as a syllable um, or correctly labeled noise as noise. So 
So up top, what I'm going to be showing you is the mean accuracy of classification for TweetyNet, so how often that it was correct. So here are those values. Um, and the heights, again, are how accurate they are. So higher uh, bars means better accuracy. And accuracy is really good on uh, closely related species. So we get about to 90% for the same species. But the more distantly related that you get, this drops. So it's only about 75 species for, uh, for 75 percent, excuse me, for species in different orders. So in this case, comparing white-crowned sparrows to Acadian flycatchers. This drop seems to be somewhere after the genus level. So the two sparrow species are able to be classified fairly accurately. And this is probably because the two sparrows have very similar syllable types that they use, even though they sound different. So just to show you what I mean, here's the white-crowned sparrow again. This is the white-throated. This is a northern cardinal. And then this is an Acadian flycatcher. The Acadian flycatcher is very short. Um, but hopefully you can tell that the sparrows have very similar syllables that they're using, especially compared to the cardinals and the flycatchers, who are very different. OK, um, so it works on different species. That's good. Uh, let's go back to white-crowned sparrows. Once we have uh, automatically labeled the syllables, we then are going to use a tool, which is called sound shape, to describe the sound in an automatic way. Now, people are very good at looking at differences between syllables. So here I have recreated the syllables in a very super simplified form. I've just labeled them from A to E. And again, people can really look at these and intuitively go, oh, syllables C and E kind of look like each other. Maybe they're more similar because they're both repeats of two. But computers are bad at this, and we need to teach a computer to do it. And fortunately, we do that with math. Um, so we'll take these syllable shapes, which are at the top, and we convert them into a grid at the bottom. So each of these uh, points along the grid are filled in if there is sound and empty if there is not sound. And mathematically, we represent this as higher numbers if the grid is filled in and lower numbers if it's not. So this is just one of those syllables. And hopefully, you can see that in the empty grid cells, there are zeros. and the full grid cells, there are ones. So from that, we can calculate just how different each of these are from one another without having to have a human step in and manually quantify that. Now I'm going to skip over the rest of the map. But what we ultimately do is we can summarize the shapes in two dimensions. And these dimensions are different depending on the question we ask. So here I'm just showing it to you for the white crown sparrows. So on the right, I've shown you where the shapes end up along these two dimensions. So from left to right, they're organized from the ones on the left being really long syllables with really thin bandwidth, so like our first note A. And then the ones all the way to the right have really short syllables, but they have a really uh, wide bandwidth. So these two double note syllables, they're short but wide. And then from top to bottom, um, this is talking about whether the sounds are generally higher pitched or lower pitched. So these ones toward the bottom have those really low pitches in them, whereas the ones at the top don't. Um, for those of you that are curious, this is called a principal component analysis. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to fall out along these two dimensions, but this is what we get with these data. OK. All that I just showed you was an example from just white crown sparrows. Uh, but we can do this for many species songs at once. So I'm going to show you examples from these three species. Again, it's white-crowned sparrow, which is in solid red, the white-throated sparrow, which is in dashed green, and the northern cardinal, which is in dotted blue. So this is what our analysis might look like. So these are the same two dimensions I was just talking about, but these aren't actual results. Um, this is more an example of what we will be doing with the actual results in a minute. Um, but this is more for illustration. So in this case, each of these ovals surrounds a bunch of syllables for one species according to the colors. And they vary according, again, to how long their syllables are, how wide their bandwidth is, and the actual pitch. And then using these ovals, which we can calculate mathematically, we can get some useful information. So the first useful thing we can extract is the type of the syllables that are used on average per song. And we indicate this by calculating on these colored cross marks what the average center point of this shape is. So in this case, 
the white crowned sparrow and the white throated sparrow tend to overlap. So they have the same, very similar average uh, syllables that they use. But the northern cardinal tends to have um, much shorter and wider syllables on average. The other thing that we can extract is the overall diversity of the syllables or how many different kinds of syllables are being used, which is the size of the oval. So the white crown sparrow and the northern cardinal, they both have multiple different kinds of syllables, so they have a much larger oval. So they have a lot more diversity than the white-throated sparrow, which has both a much smaller oval and really only uses one or two kinds of syllables. Okay, so I admit that was a bit of math, um, but hopefully it's exciting math. I find it super exciting, at least. Um, so what have we learned? What do we actually get out of these data? First things first, using spectrograms, we can automatically separate them into their syllables using machine learning, and that can save us buckets of time. Those syllables can then be automatically characterized and classified by using their shapes. And then the songs overall can be quantified in the kinds of sounds and how many sounds are actually being used. And we can do this for one species, many species, individual songs within species, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to stop again in case there are any questions. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please unmute and, and ask your question, or again, type into the chat. Dr. Provost, I have a question. Um, have you ever analyzed something like a winter wren? So I personally haven't, um, but um, it's definitely one of those species out there that, well, wrens in general have like crazy songs. Um, so it, it's definitely the wrens in general I would love to tackle. We're doing white crown sparrows right now um, for a couple of reasons. One, we know a lot about their biology, a bit of a spoiler for the rest of the talk. Um, but two, um, the last curator who was here who retired um, Doug Nelson. His main study system was white crown sparrows. The Horror Lab has a lot of white crown sparrow data. Um, so the 34,000 recordings, I want to say about 10,000 alone are white crown sparrows. And almost none of them were recorded by Bloor, um, hmm. which is pretty interesting. Um, so, but for sure, moving on to all other kinds of species, including winter wrens, would be really exciting. I would really like to know what they're doing and how well these processes work on them. Um, knock on wood, they work pretty well. Um, I haven't run into any issues so far. Thank you. I, I don't see or hear any other questions, so I guess we can continue. Thank you. Great. So this will be uh, the final third of my talk. Um, so after this, I would also encourage you, if you have any general questions that aren't related to the talk, um, you can definitely save it for once I have finished. But regardless, we've made our data useful. Um, so we've summarized it in a way that we can use. And now we want to ask questions about biology. So in this case, we want to know, how does communication evolve across bird communities using that really useful data? Now the first thing we have to think about is what we already know about how communication evolves. Um, and there's a lot we do know and a lot we don't know. We know that there are a lot of factors. And I talked about a few of them earlier briefly. At the same time, there's a lot of stuff we're only just scratching the surface on. So I'm going to walk you through five brief hypotheses about what we do know about communication so far. First, the habitats and climates that birds experience can really change their songs. So for example, birds in forests have to account for the fact that trees and other vegetation really causes their song to be muffled. Birds on the open, on the other hand, um, in grasslands, they can sing much further, but that comes with the risk of potentially having predators be able to spot you more. Um, so managing those two things is thought to happen by a process called adaptation. We also know that both within and between species, the, the, the songs that are sung matter for a lot of reasons. So song in particular is important during the breeding season um, because it helps mediate interactions between males and females. 
But other kinds of communication, like alarm calls, they can be listened to by many different species. So for example, in winter mixed flocks. And there's many reasons why this happens, um, but the one I'm gonna be focusing on, we're gonna call reinforcement. And I will talk more about that in depth later. We know that urbanization and human interactions really influence song. So the low pitch sounds of cars on pavement have been proven to cause birds to sing at higher pitches so that they don't interfere. Sometimes the communication styles that evolve are due to constraints in the brain. So some birds have songs they know innately, just need to practice. Some birds are hardwired to learn only one song type and only if it contains a specific syllable. And then others, like mockingbirds, can learn songs from other species and throughout their entire lifetimes. And then finally, sometimes things happen seemingly randomly. So there's always an element of stochasticity and chance when it comes to the evolution of communication because it operates with that cultural evolution we talked about. Nobody can predict the next fad, but we know that the next fad is coming. So I'm gonna talk about three of these that we've looked at directly today. So the first is reinforcement. This is when species evolve to use different forms of communication so that they don't interfere with each other anymore. It's like discovering somebody is using the same FM radio channel as you and then switching to a different one. And this has been documented really nicely in Andean wrens. Um, so for these wrens, when the lowland and highland wrens meet, they change how they sing but they don't have to change how they sing in areas where they don't actually meet. The second hypothesis I wanna talk about is adaptation. So this is evolving to your environment. So there's two really big examples here. The one is, one is in white crown sparrows again. Um, they're the ones that sing at higher pitches to avoid road noise. And another is in a family of South American birds called Ferneriads, and for them, whether their habitat has forest or not, as well as the shape of their beaks really impacts the songs that they can sing. This is a nice example of adaptation in, in action here. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about stochasticity, um, in part because again, this is what causes dialects to form. So not just in the Northern Cardinals like I showed you in the first part of my talk, but in other groups. So for example, these Amazon parrots. We can't predict what dialects form, but we can predict that they probably will form in some capacity. All right, so now to tease apart these three different things, now we're looking at subspecies of white crowned sparrows. So you've heard a lot about white crowned sparrows by now, but these are specifically smaller groups within uh, white crowned sparrows. Their typical songs are pictured in these spectrograms at the left, and I'll play them in a minute. Um, but you can see that they all, again, start with one long whistle note, and then the rest of the song is pretty variable. So these are distributed across North America, so along with the songs, I'll also be showing you where they breed, roughly. So in light blue, we've got Gambellii, and it sounds like this. In dark blue, we have Leucophrys. Uh, this is probably the form you're most familiar with because they migrate through the Midwest and the Northeast, and it sounds like this. Next we have in red, we have Orientha. This is really a Rocky Mountains form, and it sounds like this. In purple, we have Pugetensis. This is a Northwest coastal form, sounds like this. And then lastly in green, we have Metalli. Uh, this is a Southwest coast form that sounds like this. And both Pugetensis and Natale are interesting because unlike the other three, these ones don't actually migrate. They're sedentary year round. Now we also have some regions where the two forms will mix with each other and overlap. So Gambellii mixes with Leucophrys and Orientha in different parts of its range, and Pugetensis and Natale actually also mix with each other. And the two coastal forms have had a lot of research done on them because in their zone of overlap, it's also a hybrid zone where they breed together. The rest are not quite so dramatic. Okay, so we know where the subspecies are and what they sound like. Now we wanna to start to actually investigate our hypotheses. So first let's talk about reinforcement. Do the species change how they sing based off of whether or not they're in contact with each other? So I'm going to show you some data on the right. It looks pretty messy, but I'll walk you through it. 
So this is what they look like for each of those five subspecies. The subspecies are color-coded. Um, these lines that are surrounding all of the dots, they surround the syllables that are present in each subspecies. And again, the average, so the middle point of these polygons, are marked with crosses. So the crosses represent the average type of sound that's being used. Um, again, with uh, one dimension of variation uh, from left to right and one from top to bottom. Now, when we compare the sound types, Puget tensis, which is in purple, and the tally, which is in green, are both very different from each other and also very different from the rest of the subspecies which really strongly tells us that, yes, they use different syllable types. These are the two that are in contact with each other, and that really supports this reinforcement hypothesis. Plus, it's nice to know that these are fully automated methods, and they're telling us the same thing that we already know about uh, research done on the coastal white crown sparrows. Okay, so we'll shift gears a little. Let's now look at the number of sounds that the sparrows use. So that's the relative size of those polygons that I just showed you. So here they are as a bar chart. So the subspecies are shown with the same colors. And the number of sounds that are used by each is represented by the height of the bars. And the heights are standardized um, by the total number of sounds that are used in the whole species. So the whole species uses 100% of the sounds. And the individual subspecies range from using about 80% of the sounds to 40% of the sounds. And again, these two coastal subspecies, so Natali in green and Pugetensis in purple, they have a really reduced volume compared to the others. They are using fewer sounds in their repertoire. So we think that this is happening because when these birds are in contact with each other, rather than evolving completely new syllables, we think that they stop using the sounds that they had previously shared. So overall, the number of syllables that they use decreases. They don't overlap anymore, but now they have less songs and they have less syllables in their repertoire to play with. We can also look at the same data. So not just looking at subspecies, but looking at geography, um, which roughly maps to subspecies, I admit. Um, but here on the right is a map of that song diversity, so the number of sounds that are used per grid cell across North America. So warmer colors, again, are higher values, cooler colors are lower values, and gray is no songs present. So we do see that there's variation, so some places have a lot of sounds and some don't. But most of the range is gray. So most of the range of the white crown sparrows, we don't have sufficient data to run this on yet. And again, if you find yourselves in these places and you see these birds, please record them. Uh, just for context, again, here's that classic coastal contact zone I keep mentioning um, because they not only have a lot of attention, but they also have a lot of recordings having been done to figure out what's going on with them. All right, so that's reinforcement. That's our first hypothesis. Now, what about adaptation? Is there an impact of the environment in particular on the songs of white crown sparrows across North America? So we asked that question using temperature and precipitation. And so we really want to use that to get an idea of the kinds of habitats that birds are living in. So here's results from one of the analyses. So from left to right, that's the difference in the temperature between regions. And from top to bottom, that's the difference in the types of sounds that are being used. And what we find here um, is that when two birds are living in similar temperatures, their songs tend to be more similar than expected. And when two birds are living in more different temperatures, their songs tend to be more different than expected. So there's a pretty cool and clear correlation where temperature is having an impact on the types of sounds that white-crowned sparrows are using. This is probably, again, because different habitats are associated with different temperatures and the sparrows are adapting to their environments. We don't see this happen with precipitation, though. So how much it rains does not seem to impact whether or not you sing different syllables. And then when we look not just at the types of sounds, but the overall numbers of sounds, they do not change with temperature or precipitation. It does change with the amount of recordings that have actually been taken. What that tells us is that 
if we want to figure out if the number of sounds being used is changing over space, we really need to fill in some of those gaps in our data set. Um, so we're working on that now. OK. Adaptation seems like is also a factor. So these birds are adapting to their environments. What about stochasticity? And by stochasticity, really what I mean is, do we see evidence that these birds are forming dialects over space? Now, here is a very similar plot. But now from left to right, I'm showing how far apart recordings were taken from each other. And then again, from top to bottom, that's the difference in the excuse me, and the types of sounds that are used. And we find that, once again, there is a relationship here. The further apart that birds are, the more different the types of syllables that they have. And the closer apart that they are, the more similar the types of syllables. So this is directly saying that, yes, we do see dialects forming in this way. Dialects are forming, cultural evolution is proceeding in these birds. However, once again, we don't see that the actual number of sounds being produced is changing with geographic distance. And this still, we think, is because we just don't have enough recordings yet to figure out with good certainty whether or not diversity is changing. Type of sound, yes, we can figure that out. Diversity of sound, we really need to fill in some gaps. OK, so what have we learned overall for this section? Well. We do see support in white-crowned sparrows for each of these three hypotheses. For reinforcement, the sparrows have different songs in the areas they come into contact, especially along that coastal region. For adaptation, the types of sounds that are being used by white-crowned sparrows is determined at least partially by the environment, especially temperature. We could definitely keep looking at other kinds of adaptations here, um, and we would like to do that in the future. but. For the fact that we found that temperature is important is sort of a smoking gun that, yes, adaptation is probably influencing sounds. And for stochasticity, yes, dialects have formed across North America within white-crowned sparrows. It does seem to be that cultural evolution is playing a pretty big role in how these birds are communicating with each other. Now, all of that we've done on white-crowned sparrows. And if you had been paying attention, I had mentioned that we wanted to know how the community was actually evolving. Well, we've started with white-crowned sparrows, again, because we have a lot of, of data from them. Um, but our next steps, which I'm super excited about, is we're actually going to expand out to the true community scale. So not only will we be, be able to look at, do these birds form dialects? Do they show reinforcement? We can also look at how other birds and other factors associated with other birds can impact sounds in different species. Um, so we will be able to have a, a really true community scale. So we'll be able to say, how do groups of birds evolve their songs? Do they evolve them in concert? Or do they each evolve independently? Um, so stay tuned. We're looking to see if white-crowned sparrows are indicative of the rest of the community or if they're just a special case. And this is what we're currently working on. Um, so I'm more than excited to talk about this, but you might want to talk to me about it in six months. OK, so with that, I have a lot of people and institutions to thank for doing this work. Only a few of them are on this slide um, for funding, um, for advice, and so on and so forth. But Overall, I would be more than happy to take questions. And thank you once again for listening to my talk. No questions out there? Well, I'm going to ask a question again. Um, not too long ago, maybe a few months ago, there were a lot of news stories going on about white-throated sparrows, their songs changing, what was this, west to east, something like that. Can you speak on that a little bit? Are you familiar with that? So I did hear about it, although I admit I did I probably didn't keep up with it as much as I should have. 
Um, they are uh, imminently one of the species we're about to look at, though, um, since they're pretty close relatives of, of uh, white crown sparrows. Um, so I can't personally speak to what's probably driving that, but if I had to bet money, I would bet that um, if it's a gradient from east to west, they're probably adapting to something in the environment that's changing from east to west. Alternately, there are also the ends of those two ranges for white-throated sparrows are pretty far apart. They're certainly further apart than we would expect their dialects to be similar. Um, so when I mentioned the northern cardinals, how they change in as little as 10 kilometers, we think that that's not a special case. We think that most birds that um, uh, most birds are probably not able to fly for much further than that on the regular to be able to exchange these different cultures that they're forming. Um, so I'm not exactly sure specifically with white-throated sparrows what was going on, but I would bet it's one of those two things. It's either the white-throated sparrows are in different temperatures, they're in different environments, or it's a natural progression of them just simply not being able to talk to the entire species at once, so to speak. But I definitely, have, I've heard about that, it's on the back of my radar, but it's not made it on my radar yet. Yeah, I think, I thought it had something to do with, you know, one group learning the song of another group, you know, what sub, whether they're subspecies or, because I have not, I didn't really pay that much attention until, you know, you're talking about this and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember you taught them, you know, some news stories about this and they talk about, you know, how quickly evolution can occur. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, will the white throats here in the eastern U.S. be singing the western subspecies songs? From yeah. So, so don't 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 fret over it. But I just was kind of curious if you had any kind of inkling, or you know, was this is this something learned? You know, that one bird is like, hey. I learned this new song. <laughs> you might like this one too. <laughs> it's almost certainly that. Um, so, based solely off what you just told me, like absolutely, it's that these birds are are learning from their peers. Well, more accurately, they're they're learning from their peers um, as they go. And what it only takes one bird really to go, hey, I like what you're singing, and I'm going to sing that, and then that spreads out. Um, this isn't birds, um, but there is a really famous example in whales, uh, humpback whales specifically in Australia, where um, a group of rogue whales from the eastern side of Australia, which is an eastern dialect, moved to the west, western Australia very briefly, um, and then gradually over the course of the next few years, that eastern dialect spread throughout the western population um, because, well, they thought that it was just because it was new and exciting. Um, but it's the same basic idea, is that it really only takes a couple individuals to introduce something new into the population, and then cultural evolution will just run with it. Um, it makes it really hard to predict when it happens, and how it'll happen, um, but we know it will happen at some point. Very cool. That's super cool. I definitely am going to need to go big and make that a little bit. In the chat, there are several thank yous from people that they appreciated this 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 uh, program. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. I really appreciate yeah. it. All right. I guess if there's no further questions, we really really appreciate your time this evening, and thank you again. Um, I'd be looking forward to maybe having some more programming at some time. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody, have a great evening. Uh, please keep uh, in tune with uh, the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. Um, we'd love to have you write letters again with the Sherwin-Williams, but we'll be getting information to you. Thank you again, and have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>